Hello, my name's Graham Priest and I'm an Australian philosopher currently working in the City University of New York, the Graduate Centre, and we're recording uh, a number of short videos in the series on science and religion, and I'm going to be talking about the connection between Buddhism, which is certainly religion, and science. What I hope to do in these lectures is give you some sense of what Buddhism is and its relationship to science. So um, I'm assuming that uh, most people watching these videos uh, will have some idea of what science is. But I'm also guessing that most people watching these videos won't have uh, a lot of knowledge of uh, East Asian philosophy, religions, traditions. So the first thing I think I must do in order to talk about the connection between science and Buddhism is to give you uh, some sense of what Buddhism is. Now, Buddhism is no more one thing than is Christianity. Uh, Buddhism has a long history of developments of different philosophies, different ideas, and so uh, you shouldn't run away with the thought that there's something which is the Buddhism. Um, Buddhism has a, a long and distinguished history of development in a number of different uh, continents or subcontinents, and what I'm going to do in this first lecture is to give you, or try to give you, some sense of the historical development of Buddhism, uh, at least in its first, uh, let's say, 1500 years. So Buddhism starts with the thought of uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Siddhartha is born in northeast India or Nepal, we don't know where exactly, uh, and he's called the Buddha. Now, the Buddha is not his name. His name is Siddhartha Gautama. Buddha is an honorific, okay, in exactly the same way that Christ is an honorific of Jesus Christ. Buddha means the awakened one or the enlightened one, essentially the person who's got it, okay? So Siddhartha uh, is uh, active in the 5th or maybe 6th century BCE. A lot of these dates are conjectural. Um, he attains enlightenment, and then he starts to teach. And uh, after his death, Buddhism takes off, and many people engage with his thought and develop it. And uh, Buddhism develops a number of early schools. Uh, these are usually called the Abhidharma schools. Abhidharma just means higher learning, higher teaching, and that's the kind of philosophical wing of the early Buddhism. So between the Buddha's death and the turn of the common era, then a number of these early schools uh, emerge. Uh, only one of them exists nowadays. Most have faded out. The one that it, it, it still exists is Theravada Buddhism, the Way of the Elders. Um, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Now, something really important happens around the turn of the common era because a whole new class of sutras emerge. These are called the Pranyaparamita Sutras. Pranyaparamita means... Uh, perfection of wisdom. So these sutras inaugurate a whole new kind of Buddhism, Mahayana, which means literally the greater vehicle. Mahayana is distinctive, uh, both ethically and metaphysically. The, the central core of Mahayana Buddhism, central ethical core of Mahayana Buddhism, is compassion, which becomes the central virtue. Uh, the central metaphysical principle is emptiness, and we'll talk more about emptiness in a later lecture. But these characterise Mahayana Buddhism. And Mahayana Buddhism develops in India between about um, the turn of the Common Era and about 1100 uh, in the Common Era. And it develops in two forms. The first of these is inaugurated by perhaps the second most important Buddhist philosopher after the Buddha himself, Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna is working in um, maybe the first or second century. We don't know exactly. We don't know where exactly. Um, but he found something called the Madhyamaka school of Mahayana Buddhism, middle way. Um, a little later, uh, legend has it, a, a second wing of Indian Mahayana was inaugurated by uh, two philosophers, Asanga and Vasubandhu. This was Yogacara, um, means the practice of yoga. Not The name doesn't really help much. It's often called Chittimatra, mind only, and this tells you much more about it 
Uh, these were the idealists of Mahayana. So uh, you have these two wings of Indian Mahayana Buddhism and uh, later thinkers in the tradition try to pull these two things together syncretically. Whether or not they were successful is a matter of dispute, but certainly Buddhist philosophy was very active in India at the, for the whole of um, the first millennium of the common era. In fact, there was a Buddhist university in Nalanda in northeast India which at its height was reputed to have held something like 10,000 scholars. So this was an enormously big institution. If you go to India today, you will see precious little Buddhism. And the reason is that Buddhism winds up in India around the 10th, 11th, 12th century. A large part of the explanation for that is the waves of Muslim invasion, which are coming in at this time from Central Asia. So in the fighting between the Muslims and the Hindus, Buddhism gets squeezed out. And Nalanda itself was sacked uh, sometime in the 11th or 12th century. And uh, like the Library of Alexandria, legend says that when the library was uh, library of Nalanda was, was uh, sacked and burnt, it burnt for a month. So this gives you some sense of how big the university was. So this was the end of Buddhism in India, uh, to all intents and purposes, uh, until the present time. Um, but by that time, Buddhism had spread. So um, Buddhism starts to go southeast in the early years of the uh, Common Era, um, and it goes into Sri Lanka, it goes into uh, Myanmar, it goes into Thailand, and the kind of Buddhism that goes southeast is the earlier form, and in particular Theravada. So if you go to these Southeast Asian countries today, this is the kind of Buddhism that you will meet. Okay, Mahayana Buddhism, by contrast, goes northwest, up through Pakistan, Afghanistan, and the other stands, uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and so on. And it goes there uh, just before the turn of the common era, for all that, it's Mahayana that eventually takes root there. Uh, and you have to remember that at this time, Central Asia was a Greek colony because of the Alexandrian conquests. So Mahayana Buddhism becomes established in Central Asia. So there's information going backwards and forwards between China and the Middle East across the Silk Route. And one of the things that goes across the Silk Route is Buddhism. So Buddhism starts to enter China around the turn of the Common Era. And when it does that, it meets the two indigenous Chinese philosophies, uh, Confucianism and Taoism. And of these two, it was Taoism which was to have the most development, uh, or the most influence on the development of Buddhism in China. Uh, in fact, when Buddhism goes into China, uh, most of the Chinese think that Buddhism is some exotic form of Taoism. It isn't, but by the time they get it straight, then the hold of the Taoist influence on Chinese Buddhism is so strong that when the distinctively Chinese schools of Buddhism emerge, uh, these are all heavily influenced by Taoism. So uh, what, what you get with the development of Chinese Buddhism is uh, Mahayana Buddhism, both Yogacara and Madhyamaka, influenced by Taoism. And a number of distinctively Chinese Buddhist schools emerge uh, around the 5th, 6th century. One of these is Huayen. We will meet this briefly in one of the later lectures. But my guess is that you've probably never heard of any of these, except maybe one. And this is Chan. And you won't know it by that name. Buddhism... Uh, enters uh, Japan through the Korean Peninsula around the 6th century and the Chinese forms of Buddhism take hold in the Korean Peninsula and in Japan. Uh, but they're often known by different names in these countries. Um, and when Chan Buddhism goes into Japan, it's pronounced Zen. Now Zen you probably have heard of. So my guess is that if you've heard of any of these uh, Chinese Buddhist schools, you've heard of Chan by its Japanese name, which is Zen. Uh, so let me emphasize that all the Chinese Buddhisms are Mahayana, um, but they are distinctive uh, because of the influence of Taoism. So now you have a sense of uh, a little of the history 
and the geography of uh, Buddhist thought. Um, in the next lecture, what I will do is to uh, start to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the basic ideas of Buddhism now that you have a sense of the geography and the history of the subject. <laughs>